We came to a new world, a new country, started a new life, and then was able to become a business owner. They loved it. For him, that felt like a great accomplishment. Back in Poland, where everything was stripped from everybody, they couldn't own property. When they came here in 49, they actually lived on Irving Street. At first, it wasn't easy. They didn't want people to know they were Jewish. They weren't certain of what people's reactions would be. They immediately went to Opportunity School, probably Emily Griffith. It was important to them to learn how to read English, write English, become part of the community. And they studied hard, they worked hard. You know, my father would work three jobs. And my mother, she worked at Dupler's Furs, she worked at Star Bakery. My father worked at Elitch Gardens. He would drive a taxi. And here they raised four more children. I'm the youngest of five. They were very kind, they were very caring, they were very loving. Friends would ask me, do you have grandparents? And of course I didn't. And that's very hard because you feel like a part of you is missing. I didn't know what they looked like. I have no photographs of any of my family. My parents always, especially my father, always talked about the Holocaust. So we were all aware of the tragedies and what they had lived through. Sometime when they immigrated to America, he would just pull out notebooks and start writing, and then he would start over and start writing. I have all the notes. I think also it was healing for him because of his survivor's guilt. Being traumatized at such a young age, how do you ever forget that? I've always sung as a child. I just love it. It's, it's a time when you forget everything. Yeah, when you sing. When I came to the United States, I didn't want to be identified as a Holocaust survivor. I did not want to talk about my life, what it was in Europe. I worked on my language skills because I didn't want to have an accent. My dad was very religious. He always believed God was going to save us all. We had a wonderful life. We didn't know that we were poor. My parents always had enough food. I had an older sister and three brothers in between. We were very, very close family. One day, the Gestapo, the German police, came to our home, ransacked our house, made a mess out of it. I was seven years old. It was very frightening. My father was born in Boleslawitz, Poland. There were about 50 Jewish families living in the village. They were all very close to each other. Everyone was ready to help his neighbor any way they could. He helped on the farm. They had a dairy cow. They had a horse and cart that not only did they use to make deliveries from a little grocery store they had, they would also use it as a taxi. The Prince family was the largest family in the village. My mother's parents had a large family, and my father's parents had a large family. We had a great number of aunts and uncles, and we all helped each other out as much as we could. On September 1st, 1939, their lives all changed. The Nazis and their collaborators in the various states 
created ghettos in the 20th century in order to concentrate the population, to control the population, to restrict the population, to prevent escape, and that became, or those ghettos became major points of embarkation to concentration and death camps. The bombs start falling, the Germans come in, they're invading Boleslavitz and the rest of Poland. At that point, they rouse everybody out of their homes and they take them to a town in, in Germany. There they separate the Jews from the Poles into different groups. And my father, his father, his family, they watch in disbelief as they take all their precious belongings, their holy books, their talises, everything that meant something to them. They throw it in a pile and they light it on fire. We watched helpless as the German soldiers laughed and mocked us. We watched silently crying as all this was burned before our eyes. The Germans asked the rabbi, where is your God now? Then we were told, there is only one God now, and his name is Adolf Hitler. One of my father's friends comes running to the farm and he tells him, the Nazis are here, they're here to take your father. So my father runs home and he talks to the commander. I begged him not to take my father, but to take me instead. I wanted my father to be able to stay home and take care of our family. I told the headmaster that I would work very hard for him. After giving me a very careful looking over, he agreed to take me. I was 12 years old. My father's father ended up dying anyway. Um, we think he died in Posen. That was the saddest day of my life, because for the first time I had to part from my family. One of the things the Nazis did, and of course in the states they conquered, was to strip people of their citizenship. When you are no longer a citizen, when you don't have a passport, you don't have rights. Two weeks later, my sister came running back from work and she told my mom to take us into the fields because Gestapo surrounded the refinery and she thought something terrible might happen. My mom said to her, come with us, don't go back to work. She said, the Germans know me well and nothing will happen to me. She went back to work. The Germans decided that there were too many Jews working there. So they made two lines. They said, you go to the right, you go to the left. My dad wound up in the right line. My sister and my uncle wound up in the left line. When my sister saw where my dad was, she ran to be with him. People were taken by train. My dad, my sister, and brother, and many of our cousins, they took them off the train, they documented them, and they went into the gas chamber. My mom said to one of my brothers, Go home, see if it's safe to go home. He came running back. He said, it's not safe. Our house was ransacked. Things were taken out of it. We could not go back. My mom went to this friend. Her name was Pudlina. She had a little tiny house and she had an attic and she was such a good friend to my mom. So my mom asked her if we could hide in her attic, and she said yes. My mom would have to go out three times a week 
during the night and go to different homes that she could trust and get food for us. One night, my mom went out and three 19-year-old young men saw her, recognized her, and when she was returning to us, she, the Gestapo was waiting for her. Our mother was shot. She was taken to the Yedlicha jail, and the following morning, there was a certain German that would come in the morning. And whenever they found any Jews during the night, he was the designated shooter. My younger brother was very fair. He could pass for a Gentile. He decided he didn't want to stay with us any longer. We really didn't want him to leave us, but he said, I can't stay here any longer. I must go. So he left us. Friday, we hear a roar. My brother jumped up and he looked through the peepholes and he says, there are five motorcycles coming down the road. He says, they're coming for us. So the two of us ran downstairs and we hid under Pudlina's bed. Sure enough, the Gestapo, they tore down her door. One of the first places they looked was under the bed. They pulled us out into the courtyard and all the neighbors were outside looking at us. And they kept beating my brother on the shoulder because they were told there were more Jews than just the two of us. He had this huge welt. They kept beating him with a club and I kept crying to the Gestapo, please don't hurt my brother. Children suffered disproportionately. The Orthodox suffered disproportionately because they had, were more cut off from avenues of escape. Children, of course, were more vulnerable than adults were. How they managed to survive, I really don't know everyone's story of survival is idiosyncratic. It's, the, it's its own story. The 32 Jewish people from our village and all the others they had rounded up were loaded on a big cattle car on a train. There were no windows and what seemed to be no air. We were so crowded and squeezed in we could barely turn around. Finally the train started moving and we didn't know where we were going or what destiny awaited us. In 1941, the first concentration camp he goes to is Pogenberg. There he actually works on building the Autobahn and laying the railroad ties for the trains that are gonna travel to Germany. In the morning, after we took our showers, we stood in line to receive a little piece of bread. After that, we had to march about six kilometers to work. He had to carry bags of cement weighing 50 to 100 pounds. He would load them on a large ship, and then they would take the ship back to Germany. On that ship was a young couple. I didn't know who they were. Every day that we came to work, they would put a sandwich in the corner of the ship just for me. They never spoke a word to me. They would just show me where the sandwich was. They were taking a very big risk. And then he sent to another concentration camp called Finkenhurt. He has always told us this was the worst camp he had ever been in. The guards were just awful, he said. They had a bunker outside, and every night they would put 50 prisoners in this bunker and cover it over with wood. And of course, they would suffocate these prisoners. So every morning, they would pull these 50 bodies out. And they did this every night, my father said. And then when people became too weak to work or they weren't working up to the expectations of the guards, 
they take them out to the woods and they'd make them strip their clothes off, make them dig their grave, and then they'd murder them. After a time, they took us on the motorcycles and they took us to the Yedlicha jail. We arrived at the jail. The man that was in charge of the jail was Polish. And they questioned us over and over again, where are the other Jews? You have to tell us. I was crying so much that the man that was head of the jail even took me on his lap to console me. The man said to the Gestapo, take those two down into the basement cell. The cell was very, very small. It had bars on the window, but no glass. We laid down on the wood bed together to cuddle so we could keep warm. My brother got restless and he got up. And I kept saying to him, please come and cuddle me, I am so cold. He said, I want to see what's outside that window. And he stood up on the bed and he said, I'm going to try to squeeze through those bars. If I get out, you won't have any trouble because you're so little. There's a guard that comes around every so often. And when he turns the corner, then you can go and I'll meet you on the other side. And I am hysterical. Please don't leave me. He says, I'm gonna try. He manipulates himself and he's out. I pull myself up to the bars. Sure enough, the guard comes around and when he turned the corner, I get out, no problem. I was so little. I ran across the street I climbed over that huge fence and I'm in somebody's garden and I'm looking for my brother, calling his name in a whisper. Shia, where are you? No answer. I go further into the garden. Shia, where are you? No answer. I am hysterical. I don't know my way. I don't know where to go. I start crying really, really loud. My mother did not like to talk about her time in the war. It was so traumatic for her. It scarred her for the rest of her life. She thought she had a normal childhood. She did movies with friends, family. She loved going to the synagogue. She loved the high holidays. That always meant to her she could get new clothes. And then she'd go to the synagogue and she could see the fashion, what everybody was wearing. She loved it. She was close to her mother. Her family was also Hasidic Jews, very Orthodox. Yiddish was their primary language in the home. The Nazis came in and invaded Pabanicha. My mother lost everybody except for a sister. So on arrival to the camp, my mother and my aunt, they're sent to the showers. They're shaved, they get their clothing. They're screaming for each other, my mom and my aunt, because they don't recognize each other anymore. And they're calling for each other. My mother is given a prisoner number at this point. She is now prisoner 2543. Here they had to work building houses for the Germans. My mother at this point, she's only wearing what she described as a robe and wooden shoes. It's winter time. So she would take the empty cement bags, which were probably made of burlap at that point, and she'd stuff them in her robe. She got caught, and her punishment was a beating. The final solution was how Hitler and his allies in the Nazi hierarchy and in 
there are various collaborationist regimes implemented um, a plan to kill all the Jews of Europe. There wasn't, it wasn't an idea that there was gonna be Jewish reservations or something like that. The idea was to complete, exterminate everyone. A woman comes out of the house of the garden and she says, who do I hear crying? I said that I'm Jewish and I just escaped from the jail across the street and I don't know my way. Can you please, please hide me? She said, I can't hide you because my husband works the night shift at the jail. And when he comes in the morning, he'll take you right back and he'll shoot you. I wondered, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna go? And a thought came into my mind. My mother, used to take me to the public showers every Friday, and that was in Boric. If I thought maybe the lady knew where that was, and from there I could find where my aunt and uncle were hiding. So I said to the lady, excuse me, do you know where the public showers are in Boric? She said, yes. I said, can you take me there, please? She says, okay, I'll take you there. I made sure that she was long gone before I went to where my aunt and uncle were hiding because I worried that if she saw where we, I was going, she could report us to the Gestapo. I waited a long time and then I went to where my aunt and uncle were hiding. They were hiding in an attic over a stable. I started to walk up the ladder, and Mrs. Karofsky heard me rustling around. She came out and she said, Enya, what are you doing here? And I told her what had happened. By dawn, my brother came and we reunited. We hid in that attic for two more years. How the individual survivors managed through that hardship, I really don't know. I'm not always certain that they know beyond the circumstances. Psychologically, that's really a mystery. They were tough, they were traumatized, they were fortunate in their great misfortune. Some held on simply because they hoped to be reunited with their family. Some held on out of some deep survival instinct. I think of adults who survived there were many who said that the reason they stayed alive was to testify, to provide testimony after the fact. They did not doubt that the Nazis would lose, that their collaborators would lose, and that they would one day have to present a kind of witness to their suffering and to their, the terror they endured to the world. And so that kept people alive. And he's finally liberated by the American army on April 11, 1945. He was 17 years old and he weighed 44 pounds. They took him to the hospital and fed him intravenously, brought him back to health. The doctor who treated me when I started walking again came over to me and shook my hand and said, Mr. Prince, you are alive again. I didn't think you were going to make it. May God bless you and good luck in your future life. I don't know the exact dates that my father joined the American army, but he did so because he was so grateful for the Americans liberating him and nursing him back to health. In 1945, I met my wife, Sally. She was in a DP camp. That's a camp where all the people who were liberated were placed. They were people from all over the whole world, and that's how they found each other. Sally had known the same suffering I had known. She had been in the ghetto and in the camps. She had lost all her family in the war, except for one sister. On October 22nd, we got married. The whole DP camp was invited. We had a wedding outside the camp under a canopy. I had a few friends from my hometown. They got me a big present, a hat.
We were liberated by the Russian army. It took about six months. We had heard bombs going off, all of this artillery in our village. My brother was able to walk because he would go out for food, but my uncle, my cousin, and myself, my aunt was very ill at this point, and we had to be carried. We needed to get over to the American side because things were becoming bad on the Russian side. In order to get over to the American side, you had to be smuggled across the border. My brother earned enough money to pay off a guard to take us across the border. And that's how we wound up during the night in Austria in a DP camp by the name of Ranshofen. They had had their homes, their individuality, their clothing, their families, their citizenship, everything stripped from them. Many of them were recuperating from starvation. They had nowhere to go and no sense of whether the outside world really cared. Many, many came to America. And Colorado was certainly one of those destinations. America became a haven since 1881 or so. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Jewish people from Eastern Europe, Central Europe, especially Tsarist Russia, had come over to the US. They had worked hard. They had bought into the American dream. They had become assimilated, become Americanized. They had the wherewithal, the money, to help their more distant relatives who had survived the war come over. And they did, they brought them over uh, and tried to take care of them um, uh, financially, uh, put them into schools, uh, help them recover their lives. My aunt and uncle were already here in Denver, Colorado. So my uncle went to Jewish Children's Services and explained to them, my wife has one living relative of her immediate family. They need to be together. So my parents were able to come to Denver, Colorado. talented people in this DP camp. I had a pretty voice, and they always asked me to perform on stage whenever they put on plays. One night, after the performance, a woman soldier came over to me, American soldier, and she said to me, I'd like to meet your parents. And I said, I have no parents. She said, how would you like to go to America? And I looked at her and I knew she was an American, but I didn't know there was an America. I did not know. I had no education up to this point. Yeah, I told her I would have to ask my brother. And when I went home that night, I told my brother about her. He said, we want to go to America. Yes, he had tried. So she filled out papers for us. And this is how we were able to go to the United States. She started the process for us. The younger they were, the better they did. I think that young people are extraordinarily resilient. Some of the younger people married people who grew up in America and they were able to garner a sense of connection and integration from that. Others sought out survivors so that they would have someone who understood their pain and their loss. Sometimes it was the second marriage, sometimes the first family would have been 
uh, decimated. In Denver, Colorado, within the last decade, there were something about 500 survivors that were still living in Colorado, living their lives, trying to, in some way, make up for the years that were lost. When I came to the United States, I wanted to be an American. I did not want to be identified as a Holocaust survivor. So I would never speak about it. I never could even speak to my children to tell them the story because it was too painful. And when I moved to Colorado, there were not many Holocaust survivors that would speak. So I get asked all the time to speak. The survivors who I know uh, or have met in my life, they feel a responsibility. That responsibility is, is often a burden. Uh, it's, a, it's a conviction that they carry with them, that they need to testify to what they endured in a belief that by telling their story and what they suffered, they can forestall it ever happening again. We live in a state that during it, the pandemic in 2020, they signed into law, thanks to the work of, of elected officials, Holocaust survivors, educators, signed into law the, the bill that mandates education on Holocaust and genocide in public schools in the state of Colorado. And that's where we come in from the Holocaust Awareness Institute at the University of Denver. I believe that if we educate about some of these elements, people will get a sense that they too have a responsibility not to let this kind of horror occur again. My father learned to appreciate and show his tattoo more with pride because it came to me, he survived. They tried to degrade me, they tried to humiliate me, they tried to murder me. They didn't succeed, I'm here. And he won. And so did my mother, so did my aunt, and so did every other survivor out there. When I heard people talking about the Holocaust being a big lie, a fabrication, that's when I really started hurting again. That is why I began telling the real story. I want the whole world to know that there was a Holocaust. I did go through it, and I have seen it with my own eyes. Hi, I'm Governor Jared Polis, and today I'll be reading from The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien, page 220. Frodo sighed and was asleep almost before the words were spoken. Sam struggled with his own weariness, and he took Frodo's hand, and there he sat silent till deep night fell. Then at last, to keep himself awake, he crawled from the hiding place and looked out. The land seemed full of creaking and cracking and sly noises, but there was no sound of voice or of foot. Far above, 
the Ethel Duath in the west. The night sky was still dim and pale. There, peeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor high up in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land and hope returned to him. For, like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. His song in the tower had been defiance rather than hope, for then he was thinking of himself. Now, for a moment, his own fate, and even his master's, ceased to trouble him. He crawled back into the brambles and laid himself by Frodo's side, and putting away all fear, he cast himself into a deep, untroubled sleep. Hello, my name is Kwame Spearman, and I am the CEO and co-owner of the Tattered Cover Bookstores. This year, Tattered Cover, along with PBS 12, has decided to start a Leaders as Readers program. Specifically, we're trying to show how some of our state's most foremost leaders have gotten to where they are and the importance of literature in that process. Today, we have an incredibly special guest, the governor of our state, Jared Polis. Jared, it's great to have you here. It's a pleasure to be with you, Kwame. Thank you so much. And so you chose uh, an incredibly popular book, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, tell us why this was your book. And, and so it, to the extent, I, I think everyone's probably either read the book or seen the movie, but w why this book is so important to you? Or the so series I, I, I read from uh, The Return of the King, which is the final of the Lord of the Ring uh, books. Obviously now other uh, works of Tolkien in the same universe are being popularized um, on television. You know, Tolkien was really one of the great legendary uh, founding fathers of, in many ways, the fantasy genre. And uh, these are books that, that I grew up with and they're tales of uh, of, 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 of uh, brotherhood, of, of overcoming challenges, uh, introductions to fantasy worlds rife with metaphors for ours, and it was really, really fun to be able to share that excerpt today. So I'm, I'm super excited to talk about your background because you have been an entrepreneur, or you'd been an entrepreneur, entrepreneur before going into politics. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things you did when you were growing up? Well, first of all, I actually uh, grew up in many ways in the book and greeting card industry because my parents have a small publishing company. I hope you sell my mom's books. I'm sure you do in your poetry you section. You do? Um, so I went to book, you know, ABA book show. Uh, one year we, um, uh, we had published a book by Dr. Ruth, so I was like her body person for, for two days, which was fun. So I was always working at the trade shows. Uh, which aren't important as important now as they used to be. I don't even know if you go to the trade shows, do you? We do. You do. Every Great. Year. I'm glad you somebody Winter still goes. Um, I used to go to the uh, L.A. book show and 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 um, stationery show and really all of those. So I, I grew up with that. My mom's an author. Uh, my dad's an artist. Uh, and uh, I so I grew up in, in a literary household. And then I went into business and I started uh, internet companies, dot com companies selling flowers, electronic greeting cards, those sorts of things. My first company was an internet access provider. This is amazing. And so I don't want to age you, but when you were you were founding these companies, the internet was still relatively nascent. How did your interest in sci fi and fantasy help sort of steer you through this incredibly new thing? Yeah, this was kind of Internet 1.0. This is, you know, mid nineties, he's, he's late nineties. It's not, not that old. It's you know, no, mid nineties a long time ago. So uh, I grew up loving uh, science fiction. That was my main genre. So Isaac Asimov, Philip K. Dick, Orson Scott Card, mm -hmm. uh, those were some of my favorites. Uh, many of also, you know, some of the uh, cyberpunk genre, Neil Stevenson. So, I mean, you know, a lot of that was prescient in, in, in kind of predicting these kinds of communication networks and how they would work. But those are, those are what I, I read as a teenager. And so when, when, you were, you know, when you were building companies and sort of innovating, D did you sort of feel like you were in many ways doing the same thing a sci-fi writer would do, except just from a business perspective? Well, the early days of the internet were very exciting because, um, you know, I grew up where like, you know, it was, you, you couldn't, you know, it, it, like to talk long distance to somebody in some other part of the world was very expensive. To think that like you could just communicate with a server in, in uh, Kenya or India or Japan, you know, free the internet. That was a pretty exciting moment. I experienced for that for the first time in college. Before that, I did local BBSs, CompuServe, um, sort of grew up with that first generation of, um, 
you know, electronic bulletin boards and, and online services with the modems that hissed at you as you connected. <laughs> I, so I remember you that. You do. I didn't know I, if you were I old do. enough, Fawn, because I, you're I a few years younger than me. That's I, great. Yeah. And so y y your career continues. Y you achieve tons of success from an entre entrepreneurial perspective. I, I appreciate your being so humble on that. And, and so sort of talk about how books continue to influence your development and your transition into politics. Well, I, uh, you know, I, Certainly, there's a lot of good ideas in books. I mean, in addition to, we've talked all about fiction books, but certainly in terms of gaining sector expertise and, and things that I've had to learn uh, in the United States Congress as governor, uh, there's great uh, nonfiction works, there's um, digests and summaries, and so uh, the job involves a lot of reading, not always a long form uh, book reading. Sometimes it's scientific articles published in journals, certainly during COVID, read, you know, dozens if not hundreds, but but also uh, studies done in other areas. Um, a lot falls under the purview of the governor from managing healthy ecosystems to fire risk reduction and long-form articles and in magazines, sci published scientific articles and books are, are all part of getting the information that I need to be data-driven and effective. I love it. So I'm going to ask one more um, science fiction based question mm -hmm. and then we're going to get in to the Lord of the Rings. It, it, it didn't really occur to me this notion that science fiction, many science fiction um, books are talking about the future. Mm -hmm. And so are there any themes in science fiction that you're observing today that we may be living in 15, 20 years from now? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, all the authors, uh, and the ones that I read and loved, as I said, you know, Philip K. Dick, uh, kind of dystopian views of the future, Isaac Asimov, uh, you know, of course, uh, Rise and Fall of Empires through the Foundation series, uh, Robotics and AI. Uh, great work in that area. Orson Scott Card. They all had certain specific prescient aspects where they predicted things, but but it's not so much about the technology. Like any any novel, it's about the human condition, right? Or you know, even as told through the alien condition in some cases. But it's really about uh, something that you know speaks to who we are as people. So I, it's it's not. No, oh, they predicted this technology or that technology. And some of them, Arthur C. Clarke is another favorite of mine. You know really poetic work, but it's it's really just more about the, the stories they're telling and, and how that portrays an aspect of the human condition through technology, through alien species, through future humans, through whatever form they're doing it. You know, the, the, the name of the book is escaping me, but I, I recently at least had a conversation with one of our booksellers about a new sci-fi book where we've run out of water. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it sort of takes um, an approach. That's a little to close to home, I think. On, it, on it's that. incredibly <laughs> close to yeah. home, and, and and you read it, and it it, it as someone who's who's very into climate change, which is a fascinating fascinating read. Okay, let let's talk yeah, about. To, I mean, and it may be a great book, but to me, it should be. You know, I like my science fiction a little more poetic and whimsical. So it should be like in a future setting where a society names and you come up with a great name for it, like Alenium five three two, and then they're running out of Alenium five three two. So just say we're running out of water. Yeah, too close you, to home. It's too. It's just you know you, you gotta you gotta just have at least some poetic metaphor fair. for that. I think. And luckily you're not the unless you're non fiction. Then you can say we're running out of water. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Fair. So so to stay on the fiction track with the Lord of the Rings. There are so many themes that are present throughout the book, or at least so many themes that critics and, and scholars have talked about being present in the book. What are some that resonate with you, and, and why was this the book that you chose? First of all, I, I um, carefully avoid scholarly work and literary analysis. I just like to read books and have fun, so I don't know what I don't know what the literary analysis is. But this is the tale of an unlikely hero, right? Um, this is the tale of, of every man uh, really being thrust into events, having having something saving the world thrust on their shoulders, you know, from the most unlikely and humble backgrounds and how uh, they rise and show those her heroic tra traits as they undertake this, this amazing quest and interact with others along the way. So great, great story, um, great, uh, as I said, ripe with many uh, metaphors of threats um, and, and how people can overcome them in their everyday lives. I just have to ask, you're a sitting governor, we just went through a pandemic. Has this been inspirational? Do, do you see any parallels to what you've had to overcome over the past few years to Lord of the Rings? Well, the passage that I read is really about kind of dark and challenging days and the light ahead, how the light shines through. And I think despite the three largest fires in the history of our state, a global pandemic, uh, global inflation, uh, we're as a state coming together 
and we're emerging stronger on the other end um, with a strongest, strong economic recovery, uh, with you know, upping the bar on fire mitigation and risk prevention. Uh, we have one of the highest vaccination rates for COVID in the country, one of the lowest death rates in the country. So uh, there's always kind of, you always look to that light, even in the darkest days. And, and would you argue that, that books like this, or maybe even this book specifically, gave you the resilience that allows you to do great things as a governor? Well, you know, like many folks during the uh, heaviest days of the pandemic, uh, and I was, you know, a combination of working from home and, and going to other places, like a lot of folks, I had a little bit more time to be able to read. Uh, and certainly it was welcome uh, for many of us, myself included, to kind of experience and learn from some of these other uh, realities and these other portrayals and visions um, during some of those times to give inspiration. And, and so you talked about this as a story of sort of an individual going through and, and, and really trying to, in many, worlds, in many ways, save the planet. H how can sort of an everyday person take that takeaway to improve their own life? And maybe well, by the way, and when you said save the planet, again, not having read any of the literary analysis, that's an easy college or graduate paper there, just about how I got Sharon and Solomon, you know, we're destroying the trees and take it, sure. literally destroying the environment. Sure. And, and you can make the case that this was about saving the planet as it really was, as, as a quest that I undertake and many others even to this day trying to prevent uh, deforestation and uh, climate change and, and all of those issues that are occurring. So, you know, I, I think we all kind of be in, are inspired by these kinds of artistic works. It's so interesting. So, uh, on the on the lack of desire for for the scholarly analysis, I, w this is one of the books that I would say has been critiqued over the past sixty years. Why why no love for the for the scholarly? It would analysis? be fine to read, but like with the time I have, I'd rather read more books. That's fair. You know? So I mean, I I don't rather than just get so deep into one that you're reading like hundreds of articles about it. I read. Um, I read all of Agatha, I, I usually pick an author and I read all their works, so that's kind of my style. So I read, I, I, and I wish they had more often. So even a prolific author, one of the more recent ones that I read was Agatha Christie. Sure. So, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 novels, a bunch of short stories, read them all. Uh, and then I was interested enough where I did read, you know, one or two books of semi-scholarly analysis, which was interesting, but I still made me just wish that she had been even more prolific and I could have enjoyed more of her works. In fact, I, I don't know if this is common in, in, in theater, but there's, uh, in, in, in art and books, but after she passed away, her estate officially sanctioned someone else to write Agatha Christie novels. So it's Agatha Christie really? novels by, I think it's Sophie Hannon is her name, and there's like three or four that she's published in her style. In did her you read universe. those as well? I did, guilty as charged. Were and, they? Uh, they? They fit within the parameters of her universe they're not neither her would be her best works nor her worst works she's even such though a distinctive even though she didn't style. do them she does um, but it's it's one that Sophie Hannon to her credit was able to study and and write in uh, Hercule Perrois, uh and Miss uh, Marple both uh, of her two main protagonists and portray them in ways that at least the estate of Agatha it's just not too different than what happened with this actually because um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's son compiled and novelized much of the work. Not, not so much The Return of the King and Lord of the Rings. This was complete by Tolkien himself. But uh, other works were turned from scrappy notes into books by somebody other than the original author. Favorite Ag Agatha Christie book? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, let's see. I, I would say her early to mid work uh, was good. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like some of her... Uh, books to portray travels across the world, uh, in part because I don't really get to travel much as governor, but when she has uh, in, them set in kind of um, archaeological digs in ancient Babylon, the Caribbean, those are, those are fun. And so do you, do you use books to escape? So we've talked about how you know, Lord of the Rings and sci-fi perhaps helped your entrepreneurial career, gave resiliency, but do you also use books for sort of a way to escape from your day-to-day -day reality? Uh, they're fun, you know. I don't. I. I. You know, as I said, I uh, Agatha Christie's just definitely. You go back to, you know, Victorian England or sure. uh, death on the a, Nile, murder yeah, on the Orient. Wonderful, you know, and usually just in a lodge in winter with everybody there. It's it's fun. It's cozy. It's not particularly challenging in her case. It's a easy read. Uh, actually, another modern mystery writer, uh, Alexander McCall Smith, number one ladies detective agency. I just yep. found that he had a new one, so I bought it here today because those are super quick, easy reads. They're fun. Um, they're mystery, but they're, um, you know, and Agatha Christie is mystery, but it's more about the 
the setting and the characters, I mean, it's not like walloping you on the head with the mystery. Alexander McCall Smith even less so. I mean, it's just, it's just more about fun and Botswana and Africa and a sense of belonging and land and, uh, you know, I, it's, a, it's a fun, fun series. You know, w w final question, you know, I, I think we share a desire for um, children really embracing literature. There's been a lot of pre-K work done in the state of Colorado during your tenure. Um, w w what's your pitch to someone to really, really help their children engage in more books and literature? Well, certainly learning to read is critical, right? And so that's why uh, in my first term, we got free full day kindergarten for every parent and now universal preschool, which will start next year because those building blocks are so important. But like every parent, you know, my kids are eight and 10. I'm always trying to get them to read more too. Our son um, likes, I guess you could say nonfiction a lot more. So he's always very interested in that, but I'm trying to get him interested in some aspect of, of I've introduced him to some of the authors I liked. He's, um, he likes the Avatar series, which also now has sure. some, it has some serial books as well as just the graphic novels, and he reads those. And our daughter's a third grader, so she's you know still a aspiring and learning reader, and starting to move from you know picture books to uh, children's books, and and uh, and you know it's exciting to see them grow. Do you do you like graphic novels at all? One of the things I we've, do. we've yeah. seen here at Tatter Cover is there's been a huge rise in graphic novels and the type of reader mm -hmm. over a graphic novel. You go back 15 years, those were just cartoons, which had a totally yeah. different classification. Well, you had, you had still a very powerful mouse. dark mouse, of course, right? Like, yeah, I mean, so you, you've had that. But I'm glad to see them take their place uh, among other forms of um, literary um, uh, icons. And it's, it's great to see a greater part of that mix or graphic novels. I've always liked graphic novels. Um, and you know it's it's fun to see that there's more available now. Our kids love them. Most of the Avatar series are graphic novels, and they read some other ones as well. And uh, I, uh, and I Elf Quest was another one I grew up with, right? Uh, I didn't, you know, kind of in this vein, um, and still kind of an iconic early graphic novel. But you don't um, know Elf Quest. Oh, you got to know Elf Quest. Yeah. So this was '80s, um, I think. So. Uh, it might have even been the 70s or into the 90s, but that was kind of the time frame. Um, ElfQuest is a very iconic series of, of, of graphic novels, um, you know, featuring, as you might guess, uh, in, in Elven universe. Not too dissimilar from, from Tolkien's universe, um, but obviously distinct, great vision from the authors. That's awesome. I'm, I'm almost certain it's still in print because it's, it's big. I, I will see yeah. if we have it. Oh, in addition, doing the graphic novel genre, I also enjoyed uh, Persepolis, uh, really a tale of a young uh, Persian Roman Iranian woman who escaped Persia, kind of the tales of the fall of the Shah, 79, the sure. rise of the fundamentalists. So you can tell very powerful and compelling stories through that uh, genre, and um, it's exciting to see a broader diversity of, of literary forms. I really wonder if there is a connection, if, if, you, if you pulled entrepreneurs and people who've done incredibly visionary things as you've done throughout your career if there is a link to an affection for sort of sci-fi and for or reading about things that don't exist or you know fantastical worlds in which you're challenging your day-to-day -day assumptions on society do, do you think there's something there as far as a, at least a core yeah, i mean i think it's great that like science fiction authors really try to envision the challenges of the future. I mean, we now take Isaac Asimov, for example, the laws of robotics, sure. all of the laws he did exploring what's right. a person, what's not. That's very topical now. It was a thought exercise 30, 40 years ago when he wrote them. But like AI is here. Like, like you know, you can talk to these bots and you're like, is it, a lot? Is it sentient? Is it a lot? I mean, we're getting there, the Turing test. I mean, this is like, you know, the next five or 10 years will really raise a lot of these ethical questions that were raised uh, by people like Isaac Asimov, you know, half a century ago. It, 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 it's, it's fascinating to me because I've, I've never looked at it from that perspective, but it's, it, it's the same thought exercise when you are innovating to think about, you know, from a literature perspective, something that should be existing in 50 years from now. Yeah, and again, we always explore our own human condition through whatever world the author has created. But it's also interesting to enjoy the world. That's why, like Agatha Christie, it's enjoying, it's enjoyable to interest, you know, 1920s England and a country manner. I mean, that's, it's kind of fun to enjoy wherever she is, whatever she's talking about. You know, the, the science fiction authors, it's fun to explore possible futures. It always comes back to kind of the, the story of the protagonist, the antagonist, and, and, and what unfurls in the plot. Awesome. Governor Pulse, thank you so much 
for joining us on Learn Leaders as Readers program. Thank you. It's a great pleasure, Kwame. Thank you all for watching this edition. Hi, my name is Kwame Spearman, and I'm the CEO and co-owner of Tatter Cover Bookstores. This year, along with PBS 12, we've started a Leaders as Readers program, in which we take leaders in our communities and ask them about how literature has influenced their lives, and more importantly, what's their favorite book. Today, we're honored to have Senator Michael Bennett. Michael, it's great to have you on our show. Thanks, Kwame. Thanks Michael, for having me. talk to us a little bit about the book that you've selected for us. So the book I selected for you, which I bought in your bookstore, by the way, Thank the you. Tattered Cover, This Beautiful Place, and have marked up, you know, on every single page. He has very bad handwriting. My mother would be very unhappy. My handwriting is terrible and illeg illegible. But, um, you know, I have been deeply concerned for a very long time that our democracy is incredibly fragile, that democracy is fragile generally, not just here in the United States, but everywhere in the world. And there are a number of reasons for that. There are a variety of reasons for that. But one reason I think it's vulnerable here is because of the deep income inequality we have and the lack of economic mobility that we have, which wasn't always true. That wasn't, always, that wasn't the way the land of opportunity was supposed to work. We've got the worst income inequality that we've had since the 1920s, and we've got less economic mobility than almost every other industrialized country in the world has. And, and in trying to sort out you know, the election of Donald Trump and the aftermath of the election of Donald Trump, you know, it occurred to me that in, in human history, when people lose a sense of opportunity, that's when somebody shows up out of nowhere sometimes and says, I alone can fix it, as Trump said. He didn't do it, but he said, I alone can fix it. You know, you don't need a democracy. You don't need the rule of law. You should expect your public sector and your pu private sector to be hopelessly corrupt and hopelessly bankrupt. That was the dark vision he ran for president on, and that's the dark vision he won on and won more votes the second time than the first time. And I thought n there, nobody d has done a better job of kind of crystallizing why that came about, in my view, than Michael Sandel, who's a, uh, a, a professor who wrote a book called The Tyranny of Merit, uh, Can We Find the Common Good? And that is a pretty good question, I think. And, and so you give a great preface into the book What's a summary and sort of key takeaways, and then we'll go a little bit deeper I mean, there. his basic, I think his, there's so many dimensions of, of what he's trying to argue, but I'd say, first of all, he points out we're not a meritocracy, which we're not. I mean, anybody who, I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, anybody who spent time working with kids in an urban school district, I think has a sense of the profound inequality that exists in this country and the profound talent, you know, that is being ground up by institutions that aren't working as well as they should be, you know, in, 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 in th that case, the, ed the, the educational system, but there are other examples as well. So that's p first argument is we're not a meritocracy. A lot of people believe that we are. I share that view. Then he argues, well, we shouldn't want to be a meritocracy. That's just when the book gets very interesting. And, and, that, and that argument basically, he says, if you live in a place where you think it's a meritocracy, inevitably, the people who get to the top think they deserve to be at the top. And the people who are at the bottom think they deserve to be at the bottom. And what he says is that creates too weak a solidarity. That's the word he uses. Too weak a solidarity for us to be able to debate and negotiate the big moral questions that we have to move the country forward as a democracy. Um, and, you know, I still don't necessarily know whether I agree with him on the we shouldn't be a meritocracy point. 
I do think that the, his weak solidarity point is an important one, and, wh and where, what, what he concludes, and I share this view, I think, is that it's really important for us to have a democracy and an economy where everybody feels like they've got a productive role, and everybody's got the chance not to just be a consumer, you know, in what's become, unfortunately, for too many people, a, 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 an economy dominated by dollar stores and, 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 and the rest, and instead be in an economy where people can really feel like they can make a productive contribution, and not not just to the economy, but also to the democracy. So, so I want to go a little bit deeper. Um, you've had a long, illustrious career leading up to your time in the Senate. Um, previously, you were superintendent of Denver Public Schools, and, and so you, you talked about a note that Sandel makes of meritocracy is an illusion. Go a little bit deeper there. and and. How did this book sort of represent what you saw on the ground? You know, one of the things Barack Obama wrote in a book that he wrote once, he said the best thing about being in the Senate is you can get your phone call returned by anybody in the world at least once. They might not call you back again, but they 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 but they'll call you back. Did once. you make a phone call to Cambridge? I did. So <laughs> I called Michael Sandel, and that's what I do. I call when I read a book that I love or I'm really interested in. You know, I call the author and say, anytime you're going to be in D.C. Uh, or in Colorado, you know, l let me know. And um, in Michael's case, we were in COVID, and he's a preeminent, you know, he's an eminent guy, a philosopher. He was in Spain and in living in this incredibly beautiful place. And he, he let me spend an hour and a half, you know, in a conversation with him on a Saturday morning, just talking through talking through his book. And so normally I'd, I'd want to go deeper in your background, but I'm fascinated by this conversation. For, for everyone who hasn't read the book, this came out in 2020. Right. And to your point, he was trying to, in many ways, analyze what had happened in 2016. Yeah. A and he came up with sort of this theory that, you know, we over deliver or we over talk about meritocracy, right? And that actually has a really disastrous yeah. consequence, particularly yeah. for the people who feel on the yeah. wrong yeah. side of it. But what did he say in so the So well, one of the interesting things about education, that was what you'd asked me, sure. I sort of drifted off on you, was that his whole perspective is, is higher ed, and in fact, it's really the Ivy League, because he's an Ivy League professor. And what is not mentioned in this book at all is K-12 education, or the state of our K-12 system. And that was fascinating, because we then had a conversation where he sort of could illuminate some more of the stuff that he had was thinking about from the higher ed perspective, and uh, and and his conclusions were, you know, maybe we should have uh, much better vocational education, much better opportunity for people to be able to, you know, get into, you know, be able to go to the Ivy League, which the sh numbers here are shameful in terms of what 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 the most elite universities in America are 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 you know, are, are doing with respect to the poorest people in the country. That is nothing, basically. The people that, these institutions that have more than any other institutions in the country really aren't doing anything to help us solve this income inequality that we have. But what he hadn't seen was how, how, how tough the results are. And so we talked about, you know, Raj Chetty's data, for example, that shows that when you look at the lack of preschool in this country, the lack of quality of our K-12 system, and the lack of access to higher ed, um, you discover that our education system is actually reinforcing the income inequality we have instead of liberating people from their circumstances. So it's one more, you know, so people, people might make the argument to me, Michael Bennett, I don't like your Bolshevik child tax credit, you know, let's, 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 the education system should take care of all this. And my answer is, let's fix the education system because we got to give people a lot more opportunity. And what I said to Sandel was, um, you know, in my mind, the, one of the most significant things we could do for kids is say to kids that we're going to have an expectation that's real, that if you're graduating with a high school diploma in this country, you ought to graduate with the skills to earn a living wage, not just the minimum wage, so that you begin to build wealth over the course of your lifetime. I mean, that alone would transform the lives of millions of Americans and transform the American economy, but it was invisible to him. So it was just... I mean, it was interesting. He actually, he, at the end of it, he said, I'm coming to Aspen in, in uh, uh, June, I think it was. And he said, will you be on a panel with me? And I did. So I ended up at the Aspen Institute with him. That's amazing. Kind well, of interviewing him about his book. Well, another part that he talks about, which, which we see with 
trying to get people interested in reading is that there's this notion of if you're doing a certain job, maybe you're on the wrong side of this sort of meritocratic spectrum. We see the same thing with reading, where if people aren't traditionally reading the canonical books, they don't consider themselves to be readers. Right. Give me some thoughts, sort of, or at least how Sandel viewed this notion of depending on what your role was in society, how you viewed yourself, and, and did you see that percolating during your days as a superintendent? You know, one of the things that he is very critical of is what he describes as the neoliberal kind of orthodoxy that began with Reagan and went through Clinton and some other stuff, where, you know, among other, among many other things, you know, we we basically privileged people in America that wanted to make stuff as cheaply as possible in China or Southeast Asia over lots of other choices we could have made, like protecting our own supply chains, like our national security, like having decent wages you know, in our country so people could actually afford to support a family. And one of the things he says is, uh, we're never gonna be satisfied just as a nation of consumers. You know, we have to feel like, as I said earlier, we're making a productive contribution and that whether people are working in this bookstore or teaching in the Denver Public Schools or, you know, um, uh, or providing people mental health services on the Western Slope, that they're, they're, they're providing a productive role. And I think part of that is what people earn. That's not the only thing, but the idea that, you know, I mean, again, to go back to schools, the idea that the Colorado Teacher of the Year this year, who's from Glenwood Springs, and she came to see me when I was in D.C. because she was getting an award there. And in passing, she wasn't even complaining. She said, um, 70 to 80 percent of the teachers in my middle school and in my high school have to work two and three jobs just to live in Glenwood Springs. You know, when I was the t superintendent in Denver, I never met a teacher who didn't live in Denver because who wouldn't want to live close to the school where they were teaching? And now if you're a teacher in Denver, you can't afford to live in Denver. Now you have to live far away. Now you have to work two or three jobs. And pretty soon you feel like you just can't get ahead. And I think a lot of Americans feel that way because of because of an economy that's worked incredibly well for the top 10%, in fact, the top 0.1, the top 1, the top 5%, but hasn't really worked for 90% of the American people who feel like they can't afford housing, they can't afford health care, they can't afford education or early childhood education. And, and when you're in a situation like that, as I said earlier, I think that's when a democracy begins to unravel and when people that don't have the interests of the democracy at heart um, have a tendency to try to overturn things. And it's a great opportunity to go into your passage. You've selected a part of the book that you'd like to read. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, um, I could have picked a bunch of different things uh, here, but I thought this one sort of captured uh, the, the kind of indictment of what I'm trying to figure sure. out. So I thought it was a th thing that might be interesting to read. One of the failures, one of the failures of the well-credentialed meritocratic elites who have governed for the past four decades is that they've not done a very, they've not done very well at putting questions such as these, moral questions, at the heart of political debate. Now as we find ourselves wondering whether democratic norms will survive, complaints about the hubris of merit meritocratic elites and the narrowness of their technocratic vision may seem trifling, but theirs was the politics that led to this moment, that produced the discontent that populist authoritarians exploit. Facing up to the failures of meritocracy and technocracy is an indispensable step toward addressing that discontent and reimagining a politics of the common good. So good. It's so good. Yeah. It, it, it's great. And it, you know, for, for those who haven't read it, I encourage you to. Michael Sandel, one of the great political philosophers of our day. And there's some very interesting theses that he presents throughout the book. You are a lifelong reader. Um, you are an author as well. L let, let's go back a little to your childhood. W what inspired you when you were growing up, and, and how did reading help cultivate you to be successful? You know, I was a, uh, uh, unusually, my mom was a school librarian, uh, and an elementary school librarian, and so we had, a, among other things, a rule in our house that you could watch 10 hours, um, or you could watch one hour of television a day, uh, but if you saved up 10 hours of TV, you'd get a book. And I was enough of a sucker, a rule follower, I don't know which was, was one or the other, that I, I did that often, you know, and every now and then 
my brother and I would watch an episode of Star Trek, so you'd lose the you'd lose the ten hours. But she she wasn't just you know she didn't just care about reading. She also she had she was a librarian. She was a professional, and she had a passion for children's literature and for um, uh, and for reading and and just and both of my parents read a lot, and I have always read a lot. I mean, I, I when I was even to this day when I um, first got into the Senate, I spent my flights back and forth from D.C., you know, reading the newspapers or reading the news or reading an article or reading stuff that my staff was working on. And about 10 years ago, I, I stopped and I started reading books on this flight. So I have, you know, people say, oh, man, it must be terrible to be on that airplane. I have eight hours a week when I'm reading stuff that most people I know never have the time to do that. And a lot of it is kind of in this vein because I am, I want to really figure out, I, I, I believe so strongly that that the election of Donald Trump was such a wrong um, direction for this country. I feel so worried that um, that the democracy is fragile and that our economy is not working well enough for enough people in this country that, um, that, that that's what's led me to read this stuff. I feel very optimistic that we're going to figure it out. You know? And are there any books that sort of hit that level of optimism or propose things that you're in favor of? I mean, I think Sandel's book, in the end, is optimistic. In the end, he's, he says, as I said, we have to find a productive role for, for people. We have to come to the, make you know, tough moral decisions, and that's what we have to make. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I say to people in my town halls all the time, all the time, for 14 years, saying to people, we didn't, this country was not created on the idea that we would agree with each other. It was created on the, with the notion that we would disagree with each other. And out of those disagreements, we would create more imaginative and more durable solutions than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. That is what democracy is supposed to be about. That's why we live in a democracy. If you want to live in a place where everybody agrees with each other, then the only place you, you will find that is possible is a totalitarian society. And we see that in Russia and China today. You know, I think we've got something else to offer here because uh, of our abundant natural resources, because of the innovation in the United States. But there's some things that we have to do. You know, we've got to create an economy that when it grows, it grows for everybody again. We've got to make this energy transition that's so critically important to our kids' future. We've got to have an immigration system that actually makes sense and continues to drive economic growth as it has for the entire history of this country. You know, we've got to educate people in America so that they can fulfill their potential. The good news for all of us is there's no shortage of stuff to do. I mean, we're going to spend the rest of our lives, I think, saving, saving this democracy. And I think that's, you know, that's a worthy enterprise. This is a, a softball question, but, you know, as you noted, country in many ways founded on this notion of debate. Some would say that debate has become polarization. Do you find books <laughs> as a possibility of that bridge. You know, you're, you're in Washington, you're seeing a lot of that polarization. What's the role of literature? You know, I, I, I wrote a book, you mentioned that earlier when we were talking about that, which I appreciate that. I think about as many people read my book as voted for me in my presidential campaign. Your, your debut but was at Tattered Cover. It was, and I really, uh, to, I mean, I liked the book very much. <laughs> and at the end of the book, and I, and I, and, and I like it mostly because I know my kids are gonna know what I thought about all this stuff someday, and, and that means a lot to me. Um, but I, I have a sec, the book is all, there's so much literature in that book that's, that, I, that I quote and that's included throughout American history, and at the end of it, I say that um, the best moments for me in a, in a town hall in Colorado, and it's very often when I'm in a red part of the state, but not always, is when somebody comes up at the end of the conversation and says to me, you're obviously reading something different than what I'm reading. What are you reading? And then I'll say, this is what I'm reading. What are you reading? And so at the end of my book, I included a bunch of stuff for further reading for people that are interested in, you know, the kinds of editions. And what were some of those books? Well, um, uh, uh, Tani Has Ta Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me, Ta Nehisi Coates, we were, uh, we were eight years in power in American tragedy. C.L.R. James's incredible book about the Haitian Revolution. 
um, uh, uh, David Blight's book about Frederick Douglass. Um, I mean, it, the list goes on and sure. on and on. You and have to buy the book to get the list. And I understand. Keep it secret. No, and you should buy. And you should, you know, buy the book and get the list because, you know, it, it's a, the list is, a, you know, in my mind, is a love letter to democracy. It's a love letter to America, and I, I, I think that reading books is an essential part of, you know. Of, of citizenship. One of the things I conclude in my book is that, you know, the way we need to think about ourselves as citizens and the role we play as citizens is as founders of this country. We have to think of ourselves in that elevated a way because, you know, that's the responsibility that we bear. And we can be good founders and we can be bad founders. You know, somebody like Frederick Douglass, who, you know, there's a great example of somebody t completely self taught. Uh, 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 born a slave in Maryland, uh, ta was taught how to read in Baltimore by by uh, the the person that his owner had shipped him to, until the until the husband you know stopped it. Uh, but then he was just reading and reading and reading. He escapes, ends up going to Massachusetts, where he meets with the abolitionist movement there. I think it was on Martha's Vineyard, and. And he basically says to them, what, what's your argument? What's the argument you're making? And they say, the argument we're making is that the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. And this guy, Frederick Douglass, born a slave, completely self-taught, says to these abolitionists, because of what he had read, says to them, you have it exactly wrong. The Constitution is an anti-slavery document. We're not living up to the words of the Constitution. And I, I just think the power of that, of being able to make an argument like that based on the knowledge he acquired, um, is the way you know, we're going to make progress in this democracy. Because our, our entire, the entire history of this country is a, is a, has been a battle between the highest ideals that have ever been written down on the page, that constitution that Frederick Douglass was talking about, and the worst impulses in human history, something Frederick Douglass knew well, in our case, human slavery. You know, and, and I think that battle in different forms exists to this day. And, and that's why it's important to understand where we've come from, because that's how you figure out where you're going. Amazing. This has been a wonderful conversation. Last question for you. In 2010, you had a commercial that I feel like has been, uh, it's a part of the political canon, where your daughters yeah. were campaigning for you. What are they reading right now? They are, uh, they are, that's a great question. So my um, uh, oldest daughter, Caroline, is a senior in college. She's studying history. She's, she's spending a lot of time reading about great powers, kind of strategy stuff. She, um, I was telling one of her friends, or she, I, she, I told Caroline about this book, and one of her, his fr her friends rolled his eyes about it. He didn't think of much of Michael Sandel as I did. But she is more important than what she's reading because of what she's read. She has recently written a really long paper about um, Denver as a port city. She took a class called Port Cities and she said to her professor, I want to argue that Denver is a port city. And the professor said, you're crazy. And she said, uh, I'm going to make this argument. And she not only made the argument, but the sources she saw, the original sources in Denver from the founders here, they were arguing that we were a port city. They were saying Columbus had run, you know, had stopped and that we were the port that was going to get us to India. That's one example. My uh, daughter, Car uh, Helena, who's my next kid, is um, uh, reading uh, literature and, and history. And she is the editor of her school newspaper oh, cool. uh, and spent the summer writing uh, newspaper articles in, in, uh, in Brunswick, Ma or in Portland, Maine. And uh, my 17 year old is, I don't know, I, 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 she's actually, she's 18 years old, first of all. And second of all, because she's 18 years old, she won't tell me what she's reading. Understood. Senator Michael Bennett, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Kwame. Thank I you appreciate for, it. <laughs> and thank you for watching, everyone.
Ivan Illich once said, neither revolution nor reformation can ultimately change society. Rather, we must tell a more powerful tale, one that sweeps away the old myths and becomes the preferred story. Welcome. Tonight, you are going to hear four heroes as they take us on a journey with them through their trials and tribulations of the impact of suicide. You see, storytelling is one of the most under-leveraged and powerful tools that we have in our toolbox of suicide prevention and suicide grief recovery. Storytelling moves souls. Storytelling is good for the storyteller. It helps put a cohesive and redemptive narrative on top of something that's often very chaotic. But it's also good for the listener because it lets the listener know they're not alone. There are other people who have shared meaningful experiences just like theirs. And when we get enough storytellers out there telling a new, more powerful tale, that's when, that's when we start to shift culture. Facts and theories, they all have their role, but nothing moves culture like a new powerful tale. What is this powerful tale that we're trying to shift? Well, some of you might know that in the United States, approximately 50,000 people die by suicide each year, like my brother did. And every single one of those deaths has a tsunami effect on their communities, often for a long time. The tale that's not being told are the 14 million people who seriously think about suicide every year. These aren't fleeting thoughts like, I just don't want to get out of bed today. These are people who are staring death down. They often have strong intent and often a plan. But let's look at the math, right? 50,000 people die. 14 million people live through it. Those are the stories we often don't get to hear. And not only do they live through it, many of them grow through these crucibles in their lives. They get help, or they get on the right medication, or they have spiritual experiences. They leave toxic jobs. They leave unhealthy relationships. They find their community. They make meaning out of their struggle and become activists for change. Those are the stories that you will hear tonight. Now, our four heroes went through a great deal of preparation to be with you tonight. They went through a series of experiences offered by United Survivors. We're, by the way, headquartered in Denver, but we do have an international footprint. And our mission is to lift up the voices of people with lived expertise for systems and cultural change. And so these four heroes, they went through online course around storytelling and a uh, conference call style retreat that spanned most of the summer. And through those experiences, they learned things like, am I ready? Am I ready to get up in front of a bunch of strangers and tell my most vulnerable part of myself? Have I thought it through? What is my why? Why do I want to share my story? What am I hoping that the story will have in terms of its impact? And if all of that leads them to, yes, I'm ready and let's do this, then what are the best practices in safe and impactful storytelling around this very daunting and sensitive issue? So that's what we did this summer. We thought it through, we practiced, we got feedback, we practiced, and they're here tonight to share their hero's journey with you. We are very proud to be partnering with PBS. What better vehicle to lift up this expertise and shift culture throughout our state and hopefully become a model for the nation that these stories matter and they will make a profound difference. So please join me in welcoming our four heroes to the stage. Jake, 
Heidi, Jose, and Silen. All right. <clears throat> All right, so there's a, uh, a proverb I read daily that states, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Because when I was in some of the darkest times of my life, darkest places of my life, I definitely was lacking vision. I was lacking purpose, so I was perishing. Growing up as a young man in the mountains, I was always super outgoing, had to be the life of the party. I was into association way more than even education. I had a hard time correlating where dissecting a cat was going to somehow translate to helping me with my taxes. So I rebelled. I lashed out. I was the kid who deed his way through high school. Actually, that's not totally true. I got a lot of C's as well. Oh, Mr. Carithers, you may see yourself out of class. Yeah. <laughs> that's beside the point. But I guarantee if we can't relate on that point, we can all connect on that next transition where you had 12 years of an identity where it was maybe around sports, music, theater, and now you're moving into a new chapter. For me, I was searching for community and connection, so I ended up in the United States military. And I thrived. I loved every minute of it. It was all applicable knowledge. It was hold a rifle like this, aim it like this, you're gonna hit the target. Everything we did was in teams or partners. I was part of something bigger. I was part of something elite. I absolutely loved serving my country. But if I gotta be real with you, I love my beautiful wife a whole lot more. Plus, she is way hotter and I'd rather sleep next to her in a bed than some dude in a foxhole. <laughs> now, January 2003, I married my best friend, Jolene, and I'm a kind of get things done kind of guy, so in one short week, we fell in love, engaged, got married, and then boom, I find myself in the Middle East as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. I'm gonna fast forward a few years because nobody needs to go down war story lane, but I'm in a big transition of my life where I'm moving into you know, from military to civilianhood, and I lost my identity. I didn't even know who I was. I mean, here I was in one instance, I was going down a special operations road, Sergeant Machine Carithers, and then there was a quick signature later, I'm civilian Jake. I started to isolate, started to self-medicate. I figured I could drink and drug my PTSD and loss of purpose away. So by 2008, we'd moved back to Colorado from the East Coast, and I had made some horrible financial decisions and buried my wife and I into a mound of debt, and life was unraveling pretty darn fast. And I find in these times, you're probably in some of your darkest, and every day I was considering taking my life, and not because I was a, a boo-hoo type of guy, I just didn't think my wife deserved such a loser. And so everything kind of comes to a head, and you have pivotal moments in your life where you're gonna have an opportunity where you can either be the victim or you can be the victor. And you can wallow in your own self-pity or you can crush that instance. Mine happened on a typical Sunday, October 2008. I'm going to sit around and watch the Packers because instead of achieving my dreams, it's easy to fulfill it through somebody else. I got a four-day-old beard, two days since a shower. I got a freaking cheese hat on my head. You know you're losing in life when you're wearing a foam cheese hat in life. <laughs> I got a beer stained Packer shirt. I got a 30 pack of Paps. I got a few bottles of Jack. I'm just going to destroy myself throughout the day. When out of nowhere, my wife comes in and she comes in with like that bulldog authority and not in like a mean, aggressive way because that's not my wife at all. My wife's one of the most caring, kind, loving people I've ever met. And she looks at me and she grabs a remote out of my hand. And she turns off the TV and she tosses it to the side. She kneels down directly in front of me. She looks me dead in the eyes. And I'm talking like, I'm talking like predator to prey, like in your soul. She goes, baby, what are you doing? Like, you're better than this. This isn't you. Where's my dreamer? Something needs to change in our lives. Because I cannot and I will not keep living like this. And she got up, she kissed me on the forehead, and she left the room. Man, not only did she leave the room, she left the empty TV, 
with an empty silhouette of an empty individual staring right back at himself. With that dumb she's had. I remember feeling so sick to my stomach, going, man, I'm better than this. Man, you're worth more than this. Something's got to change, man. And then if you share my faith, I believe God was radically working on me hard. From that day forward, everything started to change. I made some radical decisions to find some connections in my life. I had some amazing mentorship come into my life. And it was funny, as I started to pursue the resources and the people, they started to present themselves. It's funny, if you shall ask, you shall receive. And I had some amazing men come into my life. And these two individuals, I'm going to reference them in, in the best way that I can. But I, to be able to really relay who they are, you would need to spend the last 12, 13, 14 years with them like I have. But these two individuals, my buddy Howie, man, I, I, I guess the best way I could describe him is he's like the godfather, but like the good version. <laughs> he cares about people, loves people. He's got the slick back Italian hair where he's you know, super successful in business, but super successful in life. He's mentored and coached, I don't know how many people beyond just their financial dreams, but to actually living a life of significance. My buddy Matt is probably one of the most kind individuals who, he's got five amazing kids and a beautiful wife that they have the, uh, a marriage that my wife and I just emulate and strive to be like on a day-to-day -day basis. But because of those two men, they helped me dig out of the nightmare of debt I was in. They helped me build a life. They helped me create total control of time and money so that we could actually have a life and not just exist. Now moving forward, my wife and I, we're celebrating 20 years of marriage in, in January. I've been sober for 14 of them. Yeah. We have a beautiful, spunky little 13-year-old that we have the privilege of homeschooling and raising on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, actually, let me back up there real quick. My wife does the homeschooling. I am more the field trip specialist is my exact <laughs> title. Actually, my wife and I were joking. She goes, you're not even that. You're more of a distraction. So. <laughs> Outside of that, we have a booming network. Like it's, um, Sometimes I have to pinch myself because I don't even realize how blessed I am with the individuals that I have in my life, and we've had the privilege of mentoring, coaching people above and beyond, because when Howie taught me, and he goes, man, to where much is given, much is required, and you better give back, because it's cool to get your junk under control, but you better go out there and serve some other people. In comes a story, and I wish I could go down every single one of them, but I don't have time, because there's so, too many of them. I'm going to reference a buddy of mine named Logan Foster, though. Comes into my life about 10 years ago, and this big knucklehead, man, he's like my panda bear, man. He's a big old 6'4 knucklehead. Actually, I think I just gave him a couple inches. We'll go 6'2". He's like 250 pounds, and the first time I met him, we were lifting weights, and he's big into bodybuilding and stuff, and I was warming up with bench press, warming up, please, okay, with 135. And he comes over, and he goes, I didn't know we were doing curls today, and he picks up the bar and starts curling. If you've never lifted a weight before in your life, that's amazing, but that was my first image of him. Had an individual come into my life, and he came in and through connections in the recovery community that uh, he was going through the exact same thing that I was going through just a few years before. He had gotten back from a deployment from Afghanistan, loss of purpose, loss of vision with his life. He was drinking, drugging. He was doing all the dumb things that I was doing. And I'm so thankful that I believe God put us together so that not only his life could change, but he could impact mine. We're like brothers from different mothers, kindred spirits to come together to serve something bigger and better. I love that man. Now today, to see him, to be able to have 10 plus years marriage, strong, 10 plus years sober, two beautiful little girls, actually have a purpose to where he's serving, impacting countless others. I want to reference a story that my buddy Howie shared with me as he was kind of taking me down that road of, first I'm going to take you and then we're going to help others. And he talks about how a, a turtle doesn't get to the top of a fence post by itself. Somebody literally has to pick it up and put it there. I remember hearing the story the first time, and I was like, well, yeah, no doubt, like, the turtle's not going to hop up on a fence post. That's weird. But then as, over the years, as I started to break down the story, I, I realized two big things have to happen for that story to even come together. Number one, that turtle has to ask. Now, if you're super analytical like my wife, like, I get it, turtles don't talk, but just go with the story. That turtle's got to ask. It's got to seek some help. Number two, somebody's got to be willing to serve. Somebody's got to be willing to come by, pick that turtle up, put it on a, on, a, on a fence post so that it can see a different perspective. It can have a different outlook on life. I don't think we know our worth until somebody helps us see our worth. I believe 100% that our obedience can lead to somebody else's massive deliverance. And I 
kind of the crazy dude who thinks he's going to change the world, and it's usually the crazy dudes who do. I have this philosophy where I go, what if enough of us could believe in enough of us? Maybe we could impact enough of us to change this crazy world. Let's go follow through. When I was a teenager, I tried on many versions of myself. I was that kid who wore plaid shorts that I got in the boys' section and a plain white t-shirt, often laughing in my head that I was wearing the same shorts as the boy jet that just passed me. I was also that girl who had short pink spiked hair, a tight green blouse, striped skirt, knee-high mismatched socks, and pink converses. When I was 18, my final year of high school, I was sitting at the computer, my foot rested on the desk. I was eating vanilla ice cream with canned peaches on top when the phone rang. My mom answered it, and she started crying immediately. And I knew that my friend, who was only 14, died, possibly by suicide, or self-harm that went terribly wrong. I ran up into my room and I sat on my dirty clothes pile in front of my stereo. I turned on my Chris Rice CD to get some comfort and I cried. That was the night that the shadow of suicide entered my life and weighed on me. For years, I lived with passive suicidal thoughts. I prayed at night and wished that I would not wake up in the morning. I kept waking up. At some point, the suicidal thoughts became active, and I started thinking about actual ways to kill myself. One of my darkest days, I had gotten to a point where the most mundane thing could bring up a suicidal thought. It was a cold October morning, I put on my blue backpack, stepped out the door, and felt the chill of the air on my nose, numbing it like the numbness of my emotions. And I walked for 15 minutes to school. On the way to school, there was a little rock, small enough to fit in the palm of my hand, lying in the middle of the sidewalk. And my first thought, as the anger in my stomach boiled, up into my face, warming my face. How dare there be a rock in the middle of the sidewalk? I should kill myself. I moved with all of my might to kick that rock, and I missed. Deflated and defeated, I sunk deeply, and I thought, I can't even kick a rock. I should die. But yet there was a part of me, maybe a high achiever, who wanted to go to school to keep doing the thing that I knew how to do. And I walked step by step the rest of the way to school. I walked in that door, and on the left-hand side, there's a lounge, a student lounge with red velvet couches, often tea, and someone sitting, waiting for class to start. I turned and I looked, and I saw my friend Shay. She was wearing her purple sweatshirt, and she gives the best, deepest bear hugs you could ever imagine. I was glad she was there. I walked over to her, and I sat down next to her. I rested my head upon her shoulder, and she gently pushed her head on top of mine. When she did that, I started to feel my body again started to connect back to myself. And I whispered to her, the suicidal thoughts are really intense today. And we sat together until class started. She is one of the people I have asked to be part of my safety plan, along with Sally. Sally has a deep spiritual nature to her. 
I often referred to her as little Buddha, and she referred to me as little Jesus. And we connected deeply together. I also asked her to be part of my safety plan. And Mooney. An, she has age and experience and life. She has this light-hearted joy about her that she can sit through dark moments with lightness and make me know that I can get through it. I had been talking to each one of them individually about my suicidal thoughts, and I started to feel like I was burdening all of them too much. So I asked them if they'd come to coffee. We all sat together holding warm mugs in our hand, and I asked them if they would be willing to be part of a group text, because I knew that I needed their support, but I didn't want to burden them, and I didn't want to die. We came together and I asked them, and they were totally gracious and willing to be part of a group text where I could share my suicidal thoughts with them and get support. We left that moment and the days went on. Another day came up and I was walking around a lake. The suicidal thoughts, that shadow weighing deep upon my soul, the intensity increasing, and I texted them. The suicidal thoughts are really intense. I don't know why they're here. I want them to go away and I don't know what to do. I'm gonna keep walking around this lake and then I'm gonna go swimming if they're still really intense. Shay texts back. Thank you so much for telling us. I am so glad you have coping skills and that you're using them. Sally texts back. I am sending healing energy and love to you. I am here with you. Mooney texts back. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad you did. I'm right down the street if you need me. When I was talking to all of them and going to therapy, I started to connect some dots, and I started to learn that my suicidal thoughts, the actual ways I thought about killing myself, were actually telling me about a deep, unmet need that I had. I learned that when I thought about killing myself in ways that numbed my emotions, I knew that I needed deep rest. I needed to take a nap. When I thought about killing myself in self ways of self-harm, I knew that I needed exercise. I needed to move the energy out of my body. When I thought about killing myself in the most violent of ways, I knew that I needed to connect to my heart and to my soul, to know that I am not a problem and to know that I matter. After using these for a long time, they were on my safety plan and I would come back time after time after time to realize what I needed to do to take care of myself. I discovered internal family systems, IFS. It's a therapy model in which there are many parts of ourselves and there's a core, a core self. This core self is a curious, compassionate, kind, connected, loving essence that can connect to any part of ourselves, the suicidal one, the high achiever, the depressed one. One day I was working in therapy with my therapist around my suicidal thoughts. I was talking and trying to understand what they meant when a figure performed before my eyes, this shadow monster. He had fluffy fur, darkness, and gleaming yellow eyes. And he hold, held the burden of the suicide, suicidal thoughts. And I befriended him. I got curious about him. I wanted to know, what are you doing for me? What is this all about? And he told me that he was protecting parts of myself that held deep shame and deep pain. He didn't want me to experience that because it hurt too much. As I learned with him and leaned into what he was telling me, I realized that I can take care of those other parts too. And so did he. He knew that he could trust me to care for the part of myself that held shame or pain. 
And before my eyes, he let the burden of suicide go. The shadow that surrounded him, his dark fur, floated into the sky, and the wind took it away. And then he transformed. And he looked a lot like Prince Eric from The Little Mermaid, but with blonde hair. And he told me that his name was Ryan. Ryan has become one of the most compassionate parts of myself. And his job now in my system, with my other parts, is to sit and to give them care and compassion. That is why I am now an IFS therapist, specializing, <laughs> thanks, specializing in helping adults who have suicidal thoughts so that they can continue to live too. I am also a mom to this beautiful, gorgeous little girl right here. She is, she is now 19 months old. My story continues through her and with her. The Project Semicolon, this tattoo that I have on my arm, was the first tattoo I ever got, and I actually got it with Shay and with Sally together. It's part of the Project Semicolon. It means that there is not a period at the end of my life, that my story continues, that I continue. And mine specifically, if you cover up the top dot, is a comma, a red comma. It is the God is still speaking comma of the United Church of Christ. Not only is my life and my story continuing, but God continues to speak in my life. So I uh, called him the snake whisperer. He was a son, husband, father, soldier, leader, warrior, a brother. He was tall, young, proud, fearless. I remember he would wear his hat ranger rolled, and his bill bent together. I had the honor of serving with him during my time in the Army. His country accent stuck out to me. It reminded me of friends I had growing up and soldiers I had in the past. I found him easy to talk to, and he was fun to be around. He earned his name the Snake Whisperer, by the actions one day while training in the field. It was our field training exercise in Fort Benning, Georgia. We were evaluating the soldiers on their field skills. Walking through the woods, land navigation, planning and execution of their battle drills. The hot, humid summer weather in Georgia made this training particularly difficult. Soldiers had come up to us and they told us that they had a rattlesnake in their living area. That's when the snake whisperer jumped up, said, don't worry about it, I got it. We all got a little concerned because uh, we live by one rule in the field and you don't mess with the wildlife, all right? We told him, this ain't a good idea. He thought otherwise. He had a... Uh, grabbed the shovel, used the wooden handle to pin the snake's head down. Am I good? Y'all hear me? All right. So he pinned the snake's head down. He reached down, grabbed it with his hand, picked it up and carried it off. We knew then we didn't have to worry about snakes anymore in the field. That was the type of guy he was. He was fearless. In 2016, after 22 years of service in the Army, I retired. 
I remember receiving my DD-214. This is a paperwork they give you when you get out of the Army. I couldn't believe it. I would never wear my uniform again. And thinking about that made me very sad because I loved being a soldier. To be honest, I didn't know what I was going to do when I retired. I was scared because all I knew was the Army. I stressed wondering, how was I going to provide for my family financially, medically? What if I don't start working immediately? How long would I last financially? What would I do all day? How long could I be home before I started going crazy? I had a purpose in the Army. I just didn't know what my purpose was going to be once I was out of the Army. Luckily, I found the Veterans in Piping, or VIP. This program teaches military personnel preparing to transition out of the military how to weld and gives them a trade and a career in the United Association as a pipe fitter anywhere in the United States. It helped me find my purpose as a welder, and it guaranteed me a job during a stressful time. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't find the VIP. I don't know where I would have ended up. The VIP gave me the purpose, and Local 58 continued it as an apprentice, and now as a journeyman. In 2019, I was about a year out from becoming a building trades journeyman, pipe fitter. It was a regular day like any other day. I was waiting for him to open the doors. We usually show up early so we could talk a while and our foreman can lay us out and tell us what our task is for that day. We were remodeling an education center. So I grabbed my tools. I remember grabbing my plans and my materials. I was pretty excited because we were about to put pipe up. I couldn't wait to see what it looked like. As the day went along, I remember looking for the next section of pipe to put up. That's when one of my friends had texted me. He had sent me a message, and the message said, I hope you're doing okay, brother. Unfortunately, I have some bad news. The snake whisperer killed himself the other day. I remember stopping and just being like in shock. I told him, what? What happened? I don't know. That's just what I'm hearing right now, he replied. I asked him, was he still in? He said he had gotten out after he was done with his platoon sergeant time. I told him, this sucks, bro. It sucks real bad. If you ever need anything, hit me up. I hate seeing this, he said. I told him, same here. I couldn't believe it. How could he have died by suicide? He was the last person I thought would ever do that. I started thinking if this could happen to somebody as strong and fearless as him, it could happen to me. I was wondering, what can I do to protect myself from a tragedy like this? How can I help others find a viable future so it doesn't happen again? I appreciated the VIP program so much that I became an instructor. I uh, started teaching students a trade so they could transition into the civilian life and have a career to support their family. to make it to where they wouldn't have as much anxiety as I did. 
That's my purpose now, to help their transition a little easier. It takes away some of the stress and worries they have when they see somebody who has gone through what they were going through. They all have all the same stresses and worries. It doesn't matter if they spent 20 years retiring or three years in the military. The transition is just stressful. Knowing that the transition for, the suicide rate for transitioning military is so high, the veteran in piping started training on peer support so that we could help or have the tools to help the apprentices, have the resources to help the apprentices. Over many months, we've built skills uh, in listening, reflecting, and mental health. We learned about coping strategies and how mental health works. It's been great watching all the peers go through our training. We use uh, We use role-playing the skills so that we can understand how the, these tools work. While we were hesitant at the beginning, we now understand the impact listening and empathy has. And most importantly, we don't give them answers. We don't know advice. We just listen. I'd like to tell you about a student we have in our program. We started the day just like any other normal day. They come in, we talk about what they're going to do. We answer any questions about welding. And then we send them off to weld. As we're walking around, we're looking at them and checking their welds. And one of them, he's not welding very well. He doesn't look like his normal self. He looks like something's wrong. He's not talking. He's not interactive. He's just not his jolly, happy self. And his weld, his weld's just looking bad. He didn't look like his head was in it. So normally, being the guy I had before the training, or the guy I was, I would have went up to this kid and been like, what the hell? I was like, you got to be kidding me. This looks like crap. Now, because of the training, I know that I need to ask him, is everything all right? Is there something wrong? Do you need to talk? He told me there was something wrong. He had found out that his brother had had cancer, and he wasn't taking it well at all. It was affecting not only his welding, it was affecting his personal life and his relationship with his wife. So I told him, would you like to go talk to someone? Is there anybody you feel comfortable going to see? He said he did. He's like, I want to go talk to my chaplain. It's like, all right. Go take care of yourself. I remember when he came back, he had looked totally different. He looked like his old self again. He looked like a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. He was starting to talk to everybody, interact again. And most importantly, his 
was enjoying what he was doing. He was welding way better. I appreciate the training I went through because if I didn't have it, I don't know what would have happened to him. So I'm thankful for that. The training has helped me take off my blinders. I remember before, I thought you should be macho, man. You should just suck it up, keep pushing through. Now I know that that doesn't work. I saw it in the military. I had the macho man mentality growing up, and I see it in the construction world. And I know it doesn't work. I think back and I remember times where I probably should have went and talked to somebody or got help. I know now that if I ever feel lonely, depressed, lost, hopeless, there's someone I can call to help me. To the snake whisperer, I know I can't bring you back, but I will carry you with me as I move forward, and I will look at trying to do everything I can to ensure that nobody else has to be lonely ever again. When I was growing up, I didn't feel possible. And by possible, I don't mean possibility. My life was really brimming with possibility. I grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado, white suburbia, upper middle class. My summers included things like piano lessons and Girl Scout camps, water fights in the park with my friends. On paper, my future seemed pretty limitless. I got great grades was in seven-plus extracurriculars, lots of advanced classes, but still, something felt deeply wrong. And by that, I mean I couldn't see myself living for very long. Starting around the age of 13, I felt deeply sad, and I didn't know why. For almost a decade, me, my friends, the adults around me, weren't really sure if I was going to live or die. This photo you see on the screen is a body drawing I did of myself at age 18, and it encapsulates a lot of how I saw myself as a teenager. By the age of 18, I had been going to therapy off and on for five years, collected a couple diagnoses, tried several medications, and all of those things helped, and maybe those things saved my life. But even after five years of those things, I couldn't see myself belonging to the world. I saw myself with medication and prescription labels in my stomach burning with confusion. I saw myself with scars all over my legs because cutting was the only way I knew how to stay alive. I saw myself with a small, broken heart that cared, that really cared about all the injustice I was seeing in the world, but was told too many times that if I didn't love myself, I couldn't help anyone else, and thus I felt worthless. I saw myself with railroad tracks on the soles of my feet from the frequency with which I flirted with death. I saw myself with the smallest band of queer pride on my wrist, jagged with piano keys. And I saw myself with ideas, beautiful music, trees and constellations in my head that I couldn't quite bring into reality. But probably most telling of all was the position I chose to trace my body in. Collapsed, as if I had fallen in front of a train, never to get up again. In Jose Esteban Munoz's book, Cruising Utopia, Queerness is described as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality, as a longing that propels us onward, as that thing that lets us feel this world is not enough, and indeed, something is missing. In that ephemeral, poetic way, I needed people to show me what was missing, to show me that I was possible. In order to envision a future for myself in which I wasn't dead, 
First, I needed to discover who I was, then embrace my identities, and finally be celebrated for who I was. That first spark of possible, that first spark of discovery happened for me when I was 19 years old. I went to the mountainside to claim woman, because that feel, felt like the only way to heal the wounded feminine in me. But then I met non-binary adults for the first time, and I saw within them a glimmer of recognition, that spark of possible. You see, when I was growing up, I knew of a couple transgender people, but I didn't know their stories. And the only available narratives to me about being trans were those stereotypical ones, like, I always knew since I was four years old, or I feel trapped in the wrong body. And those stories are true for some people, but they weren't true for me. But those were the stories that were given to me by a cisgender-centric world that wants to make being trans the last possible option, an option only if your life is totally miserable without it. And my life seemed pretty precarious, but I didn't think it was because I was trans. You see, I needed to see other people embodying their gender queerness so that the gender queer part in me had a mirror with which to name myself. But I didn't put the pieces together all right away. And so, with that glimmer of non-binary recognition that I didn't know how to name, the ponderosa pines and the aspen tree, I cut off all my hair to mark my transition into womanhood. And immediately afterwards, I felt this stir of curiosity, and I found myself, without knowing why, asking the non-binary people, what does masculinity mean to you? And their answers started to break every gender box in my head. For so long, I had equated masculinity only with empire, with destruction, with violence. But in these non-binary people that I met, I saw them inhabiting a queer masculinity, a masculinity that seemed to belong to them alone. And it felt powerful and life-affirming, creative and possible. My world grew a little bit that day, and it started to grow in a way that meant my future might be big enough to include me within it. Fast forward four months, I was performing as a drag king, feeling like it was less like a costume and more like a part of me, dancing this fire of defiance in me that made me feel possible, that helped me shed the parts of myself that had made me so small. I started hearing voices entering women's restrooms, voices that would say, are you a woman, are you a woman, are you a woman, to which I would say, oh my gods, stop asking. Because that question was so terrifying. That question would unravel everything in my life that I knew and everything in my life that I didn't know. But just on the other side of that question was an unfettered joy I didn't know existed, because for so long I had strived for only ordinary contentment. I had seen that my world could be bigger, I had seen I was not confined to the box of cisgender. So next, I had to learn how to embrace my identity. So I joined a transgender community choir that was open to quote-unquote allies, started experimenting with they-them pronouns, experimenting with different names, noticing how envious I would start to feel from the other trans mass people in the choir who could sing bass and baritone. Within a year, I had my own prescription for testosterone, and sometimes I would take it on stage as part of performance art, like you see on the screen, as a way to honor and listen to the living myth in my body that said I needed to shapeshift. One thing that helped me embrace my identity was learning about my LGBTQ plus history, learning about my queer and trans ancestors, my activist ancestors, I learned that my activist ancestors would throw Compton cafeteria trays, finally fed up from regular discrimination and sexual assault from the police. I learned that my activist ancestors would throw fake blood off of balconies, they would infiltrate the New York Stock Exchange, they would pull a giant condom over the Paris obelisk, they would disrupt Catholic mass with die-ins. I learned that my activist ancestors were so grief-stricken. They were watching all their friends around them die of AIDS, but were still showing up to protest, still showing up even when the President of the United States would not even utter the word AIDS for four years. I learned that my activist ancestors found within them an unshakable conviction that demanded, we deserve to live. I felt proud being connected to a heritage like that, being part of a community so bound by our authenticity and love for one another. So finally, I was made possible by being seen in community. I went back to the mountainside to claim soft queer boy of infinite love, 
shapeshifter who knows wholeness on the changing winds, guide who lusts for the voyage of the underworld. And these antlers that you see on the screen were given to me by a trans elder I met who saw me in all of those words. And he was only 50 at the time, but too many of us become elders too young. And he took my hands in his and he said, I see you, shapeshifter. I see you, edgewalker. I see that you need your underworld journeys. That is part of your gift. But you need to come back every time. Come back every time. Come back every time. Your community needs you to. And within those words, that trans elder gave me something that my psychiatrist never could, a sense of belonging. My life was saved by my peers, by the other queer people who had gone through it, who listened so deeply to their own authenticity, they found within them a truth that had never been uttered before, that left me a roadmap to stay alive. Peer support is important to me because it asks, how do you make sense of your own story? And what I've come to learn about my own story is that suicidal teenager I was, there's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong about the smallness of the world they were living in. And at the end of the day, yeah, there's probably some queer stuff going on with my brain chemistry, but I don't think there's anything broken or ill about me. And in fact, I think I have quite a bit of wisdom to offer the world because of the intimacy I have with my own underworld. Today, I stay alive for my queer and trans ancestors who couldn't. I stay alive because someone has to grieve all these ancestors erased in death. I stay alive for the glimmers of utopia I taste on the horizon that I hear in fragments when trans people laugh. I stay alive for the emergent ones, my transcendence, the LGBTQIA plus youth who might need to see there's more possible in the world, and to those trans boy 16-year-olds who wear dresses to school who show me that there's more possible in the world too. And I stay alive because in a world that daily denies my existence, staying alive is the sweetest rebellion I can dance. Thank you. We heard so many incredible stories of survivors. And I'm just wondering, Sally, with your experience, is there a theme that you've seen that survivors use to stay alive yeah. that you can share with us? Yeah, and actually there's research to back it up, which okay. makes it even of stronger. Of because you're a doctor. Well, it's not my research, but, <laughs> right. but, but kind of what was demonstrated tonight were, were, are the main themes that we find over and over again. And it's not what you think necessarily. Um, in every one of our stories here, and in the hundreds of stories that have been analyzed for themes, two things pop out. One is, I found a peer. I found someone who was on a journey, but maybe a few steps ahead of me. They were like me, in one way or another. Maybe they weren't a suicide attempt survivor, or, but they had a similarity to me. And walking along this path with them gave me hope that if they're going to make it, I'm going to make it. And the second theme is, I found a way to make meaning out of my very dark days. And maybe I make meaning to be a suicide prevention advocate, or maybe I make meaning to create activism in this other part of my life that was causing pain and I want change in it. But I de de you know, dove into that pain to find a way to create a world that keeps me here. Yeah, I definitely heard that that theme, and you know, one of the things that intrigued me when you and I were um, having happy hour talking about what we could do together, um, you know, I definitely related somewhat to the perspective of much like so many need a mentor, right? If you want to get somewhere in your career, or you have a goal somewhere, you have a mentor to show you how to do it and what you're doing here and what these stories will do and we will broadcast them in every place that we can put them. They're going to provide mentorship for somebody that's trying to get out of and to the next side of what they're doing. And so that's the meaning of these stories as well, correct? Correct, correct. And it's hard to be the first in your community to be vocal, visible, and visionary around such sensitive issues. And so for, like Jose, I was telling him before he got on the stage, I'm like, you're up there. Yeah. And there are millions of construction workers behind you. Mm. 
that have stories like yours and you're opening the door for them. There are millions of men of color behind you that you've now given permission to be vulnerable. It's, it's hard to powerful. be the first and there you are. Thank you, Dr. Sally. This was incredible. I'd like to invite our speakers yeah, to come, to up, come back out to stage to close us out and then we'll have a short video, so. Sit up. <laughs>